Next up we have uh, a couple of troublemakers from North Carolina, Claire Hanrahan and Coleman Smith. And uh, Claire has a lot of Kathy Kelly-like history <laughs> that I'm sure Coleman will tell you about. And Coleman is a ball of fire. Uh, I just met them recently, but they're going to introduce each other. Um, and I did want to say, yeah, we need to get the money out of politics or nothing else is going to get fixed. And, um, and while they're setting up, I just want a show of hands for anybody who's done, uh, gone to jail for justice in this room. Yeah, there you go. And how many, uh, how many of you do direct action on a regular basis? Okay, good crowd, good crowd. You ready, Coleman? Okay. Coleman and Claire. Let's slip this over here. We've got a little show to go. And, and about that, you know, whether Bush was elected or not, I thought he was, fair and square, five to four. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um, let me get this. Uh, we're going to try to stay on task and on time with this little stopwatch that is going. And, um, this is Claire Hannah here. I'm Coleman Smith. We live in Ashland, North Carolina. Uh, I'm a Carolinian. She's a Memphis native. Uh, we're Southern activists. We're not academics. And we're involved on the ground uh, in the Southeast, organizing through what we call the New South Network of War Resisters. And we're interested in meeting other activists that are resisting the empire. Uh, we're interested in alliance building across movements. And uh, we just were out here trying to find the connectivity. And I think there's been a lot of discussion about that already. Uh, we are nonviolent direct action trainers. We actually will be helping to facilitate the peacekeeper training tomorrow. Uh, we do a number of things, and we can discuss all that. Thank you, Gary, and like Molly for putting the emphasis on getting into the street. So, uh, we want to. Well, I'm, I'm particularly glad to be here, being an SMU graduate. I graduated as a single mom with a seven-year-old in tow, um, and I haven't been back since. And I do have my diploma with me. Um, I um, also am in the sister of two Vietnam War veterans who um, did not survive the toxins of Agent Orange. So I can say that my anti-militarism comes from a very deep place of abhorrence for war. And um, to blend it with environmentalism, when I connected with Mr. Smith here and his extensive work on the ground on environmental issues, we know it's a war on Earth. And we know it's a war on Earth that, is, that we all must take an interest in because this is the future. So, thank you. Uh, one, of our favorite, one of our favorite topics to look at is the military industrial complex, and we've heard a lot about that already. And, you know, all the descriptive phrases, uh, you, you know, this slide represents it. I mean, it's not, there's not a section in our culture, in our economy, in our society that isn't affected by, you know, the corporate elite and the military industrial complex. They all act outside the government, involve business, science, education, academic, call, you can just see right down the line. And it just goes and goes and goes. And if you've ever done any major research project, then you're familiar with the term rabbit hole, and we've been down hundreds of them. So we're going to try to fly through some visuals here, and we'll be uh, you know, uh, available for questions and answers later on if you want. So the uh, military industrial complex determines pushes and profits from the U.S. war policy. If you ever think, you know, if you think that uh, funding uh, a weapon system is difficult, try to defund one. And we know when we're talking about George Bush that the origins of all of this horror, if we just go back as we did to the Cold War, um, um, Eisenhower, Eisenhower era, we know Bush didn't make all of these things begin to happen, but what happened with his deregulation that we just heard from the previous pre presenters is really what has exacerbated this huge problem. So uh, if I'm not by the microphone, I've got... I've large lung capacity. Y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, some of what we're covering, I'm sure you're quite aware of, is the choir. I mean, you know, the MIC supports and exports capitalism with privatizing profits and socializing the losses. Uh, it consumes the majority of oil and petroleum. I mean, it's very difficult to get real detailed data on the military. They're not even required to report their usage uh, to anybody, basically. But the best information is that the U.S. military uses enough oil in one year to drive the entire U.S. transportation system for between 14 to 22 years. And they're using a lot of really bad, ugly stuff, the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, when you talk about the ships and the tanks. It drives global warming, climate change. 
Uh, it's exploiting the peak oil crisis, and so much of what we have found in the Bush administration is carrying over. And so we really are focusing on this this event now, but we cannot lose track that it's a string. Democrat, Republican, whatever, it is like a club that is more interested in their own welfare uh, than in our welfare. Uh, the MIC acts with impunity, which is, implies that it can do whatever it wants to do. Uh, violation of the Geneva Conventions. This this slide represents the use of weaponized uranium, uh, which uh, is a direct violation of any weapon that impacts the next generations on. And as you know, uh, uranium radioactivity is, is everywhere on the battlefields uh, in the terms of sand, and it'll be there for like you know thousands of years, if not some of millions of years. I mean, the weaponized uranium of the Fallujah children that are being born with such difficult situations of the Monsanto's Agent Orange and, of course, the PTSD that hits so many people. Um, it is polluting our physical, culture, and political environment. Um, move on. Um, this one here, uh, many of you may know about Operation Paperclip. Uh, the U.S. recruited at least 1,600 Nazi scientists and brought them in because of their rocket um, ability to... Uh, These were all engineers and scientists. These were the real Dutch Nazis that were doing experiments on humans and building all the amazing things that we wanted. And they, they were given like new identities. Their, their criminal records were like expunged. They were given like jobs in academia and business and commercial behind usually CIA front. And they landed in Huntsville, Alabama at the Redstone Arsenal. And, of course, it's undermining academic freedom. The Oak Ridge Institute for Nuclear Studies came along with the uh, Manhattan Project in 46. And there's so much money. Someone mentioned how it's tied, you know, the, the MIC and the war, you know, profiteering is tied to our job. Uh, this, is, this is just an indicator. Today, there's over 100 institutions um, throughout the South that are tied directly to the warfare state. And the MIC promotes what a friend of ours, uh, Chuck Faber of uh, the Quaker House in North Carolina, which has been doing counseling at Fort Bragg for active GI resistance, uh, he just moved away from that position. They don't remember for 40 years, but you know, uh, American war Christianity is everywhere. It's a particularly southern, you know, phenomenon. The U.S. is God's chosen instrument. It's fair so we're against evil doors. Advance the gospel wherever we damn well please to do it. It erodes our civil liberties. Any of us who have been out there on the street acting know as we get squeezed further and further into free speech areas, um, it, it, our own personal civil liberties, our human rights. Uh, look at the number of women raped in the military. Um, look at the rubber bullet uh, lethal assault on Occupy activists and, of course, Abu Ghraib and the horrors of Guantanamo. And the Center of Constitutional Rights alert give us this information. I mean, I'm of the opinion also that since 9-11, you know, doing it in democracy is so severe that it may never be regained unless we take to the streets and we do it. And of course, they're militarizing the homeland with this National Defense Authorization Act. And again, the Center for Constitutional Rights endorsing war without end and indefinite military <clears throat> detention without charge or trial. Something's very wrong. Real subtle how they get it into our psyche. Like NDAA. Sounds like basketball. And we've got, of course, the drones, as many of you are active on that front, for, for saturation surveillance. Um, many, many more drone bases. Our skies are going to be filled with it. That's an actual roach, about one inch long. They have a little listening devices that they can let go and just run around and listen. Uh, uh, we spoke about Bruce Gagnon. Um, he understands, of course, the South is integral in the nuclearization of space. Um, this. Uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967 banning nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction from space. We're breaking treaty after treaty um, with all of this. We have to ask, is this national defense or are we doing this full spectrum dominance? Who's, who's familiar with that term, full spectrum dominance? Most people in the military have seen it, but that is just like you know, complete control of all the elements of the battle you know, arena, using any and everything we can from peacetime incursion for Helping people like Haiti, do we have a Haiti yet? Uh, to everything across the world. The problem in defense, someone mentioned um, Dwight Eisenhower, is how far you can go without destroying from within what you're trying to defend from without. There was wisdom in this Republican president when he said these things and predicted this. So um, we are looking at the South, which is uh, arguably uh, the most militarized region in the country. 
And how did we get that? Uh, during um, 32, 45, uh, Roosevelt occupied us with military bases. He was winning votes uh, from Southern uh, representatives for his new deal, and we needed jobs, so what did he provide? He provided lots of military jobs. And I don't know if you can read that uh, bottom line, but the military maintained that there must be national sacrifice zones where weapons and soldiers can be tested for war. Welcome to the South. The South has sacrificed down where the nuclear weapons, power, radioactive waste, nerve gas, and toxins, incapacitating agents, rocket fuel, all of these, all of these things are really very present. And what neighborhoods do they find themselves most often? Uh, fence line neighborhoods, people of color and low income, people of low wealth. Um, the military itself has many super fun sites. One in every 10 Americans is living close to one. And as we were talking about Bush and his deregulation, he, uh, he stopped the tax on the major polluters. And the super funds, the super fund itself was essentially disabled. So it's been slowed almost to a crawl for cleanup. Um, they have no legal requirement of the military to uh, tell soldiers that they may be at a Superfund site, that they may actually be stationed. And then we have the, uh, if you go back in the Cold War, all these formerly used defense sites. These are no longer under control of the military, but they're toxic as hell. Uh, military bases, ammunition depots, ordnance plants, and bombing targets. In Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, North and South Carolina alone, we have over a thousand of these. And we're talking about places that the funding does not exist to clean up. In one community in North Carolina, in Butner, where they have unexploded ordnance all over subdivisions in the front yard. I don't know where Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill is. Butner yeah. is just north of Durham. It's 40,000 acres shut down and it's just everything laid around. Just, just, they, they, they decided they were not clean it up, but they would only clean up 250 feet around the belt. Uh, Doris Bradshaw, who's an activist in my hometown of Memphis, um, took on the U.S. Army Defense Depot, which is in her African-American neighborhood. And since World War II, they've been dumping without the knowledge of the residents. Arsenic, cadmium, chromium, lead, thousands of of exotic toxins, uh, PCBs, discarded mustard gas. What started out as a depot for storage of cots and blankets and rifles, you know, a few weapons, all that type of stuff, then, you know, well, let's slip this in, slip this in, slip this in. Uh, we're not completely certain as well. We think maybe there's some radioactive materials that are stored there as well. Her whole family is dealing with cancer. She says the way they treat people of color in our communities is the way the military treats people of color throughout the world. How many people remember the underground nuclear detonations in Mississippi? Ostensibly for the uh, study of seismic propagation. I mean, so th these people were like given a child, five dollars, at all, ten dollars to move out of the way to get out of the downwind. I was really interested. There's a lot of different downwinders around. But they do have a monument here, so you don't know, you won't dig there. Basically, that's what it said. That was the hole where they grabbed up all the stuff, stuck it underneath the ground, mixed with everything, and said, don't dig here. It's an old salt dome. In Gulfport, Mississippi, they're still dealing with the contamination where they stored the Agent Orange, shipped the Agent Orange, held it there a long time, and then took it out to sea and incinerated it. That's Monsanto and Dow Chemical. Um, millions and millions of people still crippled in Maine. Alabama, Anderson. Army Depot, uh, which is really curious, the storage of uh, chemical uh, components as well as chemical weapons, and eventually we're trying to uh, you know, dispose of, all trying by the choice of incineration, and uh, typically the response of uh, the Army and the Pentagon in this case, uh, where they had some leakage and some problems was, I don't know if people really know, but they did distribute 35,000 gas masks to the residents around Birmingham while they were like doing this. This is the family, I love that you can't really see it, but even the baby carriage has got like a little respirator on it, you see, but that's, that's what the family is. And they burned over 2,000 tons of uh, deadly nerve agents in that town. Um, in Alabama, again, you see the Nazi Operation Paperclip, the Redstone Bar Arsenal. Bernard Bar Bar was the most famous that you might recognize. And uh, which rockets come to the perchlorate? Perchlorate is a chemical that's a you know, one of the main components in rocket fuel, 
Uh, it's endocrine disruptors, mutagenic, it's neurogenic. Uh, they argue about it being cancerous, it probably is. But it's in the drinking water of 43 states that we know about, and it's just that's part of the impact. In North Carolina, in your Swan and Noah, we had a uh, uh, Warren Wilson College up there, the Chemtronics. It's one of those formerly used defense sites. They just haven't gotten around to cleaning it up. 50 years manufactured incapacitating agents, whatever those are, explosives and other chemical toxins. And of course, they're into our rivers and water systems. If you're local, you know we're not the fish. Um, this one is one of the most egregious betrayals of an entire uh, community with uh, Camp Lejeune's Poison Patriots. Uh, the military cover-up extended from 57 to 87 family housing units. The marine wells were contaminated, known to be contaminated. Um, this community has uh, the largest number of male marines with breast cancer ever recorded. Um, as many as one million people were exposed to up to 70 identified toxins in the contaminated water. We have to ask the Marine slogan, we take care of our own. Is this how our military takes care of the warriors? Also, the accidental dropping of atomic bombs across the South, South Carolina uh, in like 58. Fortunately, the nuclear package wasn't in it. All the uh, 8,000 pounds of conventional weapons went off. Uh, and this is in eastern North Carolina, amid uh, mid-air refueling accident, and the protocol is to, you know, with B-52 to like parachute down thermonuclear weapons, and they recovered this one. They landed in a swampy area, and it's in the ground. And when they picked it up, they realized that, uh, uh, see, it's uh, six of the seven trigger mechanisms had been like hit upon, you know, triggered upon a concussion. So they just left the other one out there because they didn't know if the machinery and vibrations would set it off. So that's going on. And then also there, this is uh, off of Tybee Island in Georgia. There's another accident in the air. There's a thermonuclear weapon that they say they can't find off of Tybee Island. Uh, in South Carolina, we've got Barnwell with the radioactive waste dump. Uh, uh, all right, we'll come back to the Savannah River site, but uh, Barnwell, South Carolina, is near Aiken, South Carolina, for uh, over 30 years. This was the only low-level radioactive waste dump east of the Rocky. The low level is a misnomer. That just means usually it could be uh, gloves with barium from a hospital and rags. It could be uh, fishable material that's just not, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, cannot be effectively used in a reactor anymore. But it's been buried there, and they're closing that down. But that's it on an active. And in Tennessee, my home state, um, it's the only state that's going to allow the massive amount of incineration of radioactive waste. 75%, consider that number of all the U.S. low-level, so-called low-level radioactive waste is dumped in Tennessee. Um, we also have in the mid Middle Point landfill an entire decommissioned nuclear reactor from Michigan. And you might ask what nuclear power has to do with nuclear weapons and with militarism and war, but the connection is very, very clear. Anybody from Michigan? And check your belt buckles and your pots and cans because they're now um, putting below regulatory concern a lot of this nuclear um, metals and things. I mean, the term below regulatory concern, there is no known, except within the scientific community, low level of radiation that does not cause some biological damage. So this is a recycling program, and you will find it, I mean, uh, beyond what, uh, bed, uh, bed, bath, and beyond, I forget that, I'm getting mixed up. You know, you know the stores, they just yeah. have recalls, and you got back the little metal containers that hold your tissues on the back of your toilet, it was radioactive. And of course, we have always the extraction by empire. We have mountaintop removal coal mining. Coleman and I were recently up um, on two areas where there was mountaintop removal. Uh, we went up on the Blair Mountain, marched to the top of that mountain, uh, and then we went to. Well, uh, in July, we went to the Hobbit 20 mountaintop removal mine. Uh, Y'all know what mountaintop removal coal mining is? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like amazing. It's just strip mine on steroids. Uh, as legal observers, we walked in, uh, we trained for a week uh, with people. We inserted 50 boats onto this, the largest open pit mine in West Virginia, maybe in the Appalachians. Uh, 20 people stayed, uh, shut the thing down for all day long. We knew it was going to be open back up, but it rang a huge bell in Charleston and actually, you know, moved the dialogue again, changed the debate. And these are people who are very strong, very, most of them are very young, not very young, are younger than I am in Claire, uh, that are very strong and very active very brave people marching into the belly of the beast. And Mr. Bush, of course, approved of mountaintop removal coal from mine. Virginia. Anyone from Virginia? Okay, but in Virginia, we have like sort of central 
Uh, that's okay. You saw that map in Virginia real quick. Like in, in central Virginia, right above North Carolina line, is the largest unmined uranium deposit in the United States. And there's a big debate about that right now, whether to go. Virginia has continued to ban it. They were going to do it, just it back and forth, back and forth. But y'all know the problems with that. So we get to the uh, legal advance in the atomic age. Um, and we understand this map represents the thermonuclear assembly line uh, in the United States. Oak Ridge, Savannah, Riverside, we mentioned earlier, Pantex in Texas. Uh, all, these, uh, all these areas play a part in the production of our thermonuclear weapon. Uh, uh, Oak Ridge, the secret city in Tennessee, uh, we were just down there um, two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, talk about civil liberties being curtailed. Um, you know, we had Buddhists and uh, folks just plucked off the street for stepping off the curb. That's where the Manhattan Project had its origin. Local farm communities there, some as few as six weeks, some as few as two, to, to, move. to move from ancestral lands to make room for the production of the nuclear weapons. And you want to talk about creative nonviolent direct action? About six months ago, an 82 year old sister and two of her 60 year old buddies. Uh, walk, cut through four security fences right to the most protected, secure, weapon-grade plutonium facility. Had to wait around for an hour, go find a guard to arrest them. Uh, they walked through, you know, three assigned lethal force areas. The guard got fired, was fired for a number of reasons, including not shooting them on site. So, so we're really involved up there in this area that we call Atomic Appalachia, which is like northeastern Tennessee, the grid over the border. We get downwind drift and downstream drift. We, we're doing you know, soil samples, not we, but the community of activists in one form or another are doing like soil samples and uh, uh, water grabs and are identifying highly enriched uranium and depleted uranium that can come from nowhere but these areas, you know, 9,500 miles downstream. Uh, back to Aiken, South Carolina, uh, which is another Cold War relic, has a gigantic <coughs> reservation there that five reactors producing uh, weapons grade plutonium. Uh, Y'all familiar with Amarillo, I'm sure. I guess Mavis here knows a bit about Mavis. that. She could tell us the stories there. Um, the nuclear warheads disassembled there now, and it's part of this so-called life extension program that you're going to see um, in Oak Ridge. Uh, TPA's uh, watch bar nuclear reaction. We mentioned that when, when, you, when you hear nuclear power, do you think nuclear weapons? It's, a, you know, it's an interchangeable, interdependent like, technology. Um, and the watch bars in Tennessee, and that's where they produce the tritium, which is the uh, hydrogen isotope that gets hydrogen bombs, you know, produced. In Tennessee, again, just up the road from us in Asheville, where we live, is Nuclear Fuel Services in Irwin. They've just been licensed for another 25 years. Um, despite their deficient safety culture and history of spills and non-reporting, they supply the fuel to the U.S. Trident First Strike nuclear submarines. Um, and then we have in Jonesboro, uh, weaponized uranium. This is a beautiful, beautiful area of our, of our country. You would hardly know in Jonesboro, the storytelling capital of the world, they're not telling the story of what is being uh, made there. Uh, of course, the U.S. stockpile of 5,000 tons of uranium waste, we give it away to people throughout the world to make weapons. And, and it comes back to us. I was supposed to program. Uh, Eight billion dollars to supersize nuclear bombs. You know, well, we 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 implied in the beginning it's not just Bush. Bush is like, mm, you know, but it's all of them. Uh, many of the Bush age policies uh, are being carried over to the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, when you hear uh, the uh, weapons that are taken off the shelves and disassembled, all time they're being uh, the plan is to increase their firepower, decrease the number, but increase the firepower. So they want another uh, 100 years worth of uh, viability shelf life, so to speak, for these weapons. So again, the evil twins, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, they're interchangeable and interdependent. Uh, they're producing materials that we need for bombs. Um, you know, uh, the burden is in on nuclear power. In the South, we defeated you know, nuclear power 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, and we didn't get the huge rush of power plants uh, schedule be built that we're fighting until um, actually the French lost their reprocessing rights and began to swarm around the Savannah Riverside that we mentioned earlier, which is that all flows will be where the reprocessing is going on. 
this is just a map. This is all these points are you know either power plants or waste dumps or weapons facilities. We don't dump off in the water anymore. We stop that. But all of this just represents the radiation hazards in our country. This is a seismic chart that shows where reactors are. We have 104 reactors in that. I forget this 80, 83 sites where we have you know. Um, Tons and tons, 70 tons, 70,000 tons of uh, spent fuel, highly radioactive material waiting to go. Uh, you remember Fukushima, uh, there's 23 Mark IV GE reactors that can fall behind in the United States, which is the same type of reactor that's going to get smashed. I mean, in, in truth, we talk a lot about grandchildren. I have two of my own I just spent the last three days with. We're wasting their future. Um, if, if each meg uh, thousand megawatt power plant can produce 500 pounds of plutonium and 30 metric tons of high-level radioactive waste, what on earth are we doing? Why do we reprocess the fuel? It's the weapons grade plutonium. Uh, <laughs> this just represents where the next generation where, where corporations are looking to build the you know, majority of the power plants that we're fighting. The South is particularly unique in this regulatory regime. It's called a uh, regulatory uh, uh, a, a monopoly. It's a regulated monopoly. They are guaranteed a profit whether they produce any electricity at all. So the Savannah River site, uh, this is a little complicated uh, diagram. We're not going to go into it, but it represents the greening of, you know, uh, you know, recycling plutonium is just that. It's recycling, so it's green. And so uh, Savannah River site is getting makeover. Doing Georgia's, uh, you know, uh, rain. Uh, they were talking about names for this uh, Cold War relic that got shut down and then revived from the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. It is now called the U.S. Energy Freedom Center. And they, they talk about how green it is, but there it is algae, a little renewable fuel, the rest of it's all nuclear. So don't you believe it when the military, all branches of the military who are aware very much of the coming dangers of climate change, their concern is how it will affect their war fighter readiness. Not any real concern for the earth and they're certainly not um, really curtailing their activities to the extent needed. And it's all about being lean green fighting machines. They see it coming. They know what's happening. They're raising the wars and the dots around the uh, uh, around the Navy uh, force, they are like knowing, they know that the fuel is going to be drying up and the petroleum is going to be harder to get. So that's why they're green. And many of you know the cost of war here more intimately and deeply than many others of us. Those of us who have family in the military, those of us who have served on battlefields, those of us who have walked on the site of mountaintop removal coal mining, those of us who looked into the face of poverty as Kathy Kelly urges us to do. We're seeing the face of war. Truth. First casualty of war. Soldiers, settlers, civilians, the sacrifice and betrayed. What a great plan to trap a bunch of people on a ship and like isolate yourself as a scientist and then let uh, you know incapacitating and nerve agents under the ship and watch what happens. Of course it's the loss of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Soldier suicides are off the chart. There's more suicides than deaths from the battlefield today. And actually, recruiters as a group inside the military at the time, right? They're under tremendous pressure. So the liberty is restricted. How do you like the idea of free speech zones? But we used to live in one. Um, our resources have been stolen. As the young woman on the right, they got money for wars and can't feed the poor. And Eisenhower, again, every gun that is made, every warship launched. You know that quote. It's a theft from those who hunger. Our entire planet is devastated. The military sonar now, Bush is deregulated, situa I mean, there are military exemptions to things like the Endangered Species Act. What does that happen at, off of Jacksonville, Florida, when they decide to do their new Navy sonar testing range where the, um, I think it's the right whale spawning ground? And we live to this earth, we listen to all creatures. You know, reassess what you think animals are child. I mean, you've seen the stories of the beach as well. What are they telling us? Or is that just accidental? Yeah. So. Uh, well, this is just some of the things that, that Molly um, yeah, talked about in George Bush's insatiable militarism, he is the number one threat to the global environment. The agony of war, Mary with like, um, you know, this is a monument past city, uh, Monica. Uh, 
and grief are? You know, we talk about civilian deaths, um, 10 civilian deaths for every soldier death since the mid 20th century. How can we stand for this? Military violence is coming home. Unfortunately, the uh, military against military violence is uh, rampant. The um, domestic violence, um, all kinds of spouses are being attacked. There's a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, epidemic of, of female fights. Running out. Uh, so <laughs> the, the revived the female spouses of white men coming back. Let's remember, George, I mean, let's remember this man here, Gandhi, and the Nuremberg Principles. International individuals have international duties which transcend national obligations of obedience. Remember that. Someone said in an earlier speech, you know, we may not all be guilty, but we're all responsible. Um, we are all responsible. Disobey. Disobey. Disobey.